Well, hey, so glad that you guys are here with us today. Uh, I'm Jeremy, one of the pastors here. And before we dive into the message, uh, yesterday was Veterans Day, and it would be more than appropriate to honor all of those that have served in some branch of the military. So if you are a veteran, would you please stand at this moment so we can show you some honor and some love. Wherever you are, put this, would you please stand? Come on, yeah. Come on, church. Show them some love. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are in a series on 1 John. Last week, we looked at a verse in particular, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. John said, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for others. And veterans, you have modeled that for every single one of us. So church, one more time for all of those that have served. Can we show them some love? Thank you so much. So glad that you're here with us today. I want to give a special shout out to those joining us online. And I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles. First John chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. So if you've got your Bible, get it out. If not, raise your hand. One of the ushers will get one to you in just a moment. If you don't have a Bible, this is our gift to you. Page 1023 in the Loner Bible, if you are using that. First John, it's a it's a study that we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. John is all about God's love. It's all about the love that we need to demonstrate for one another. The title of this sermon series is The Impact of Love and Light. And uh, last weekend, we looked at real love. And I was amazed at what I heard this weekend from just stories of people uh, in our congregation that have been showing this real genuine, unconditional, sacrificial love over the last week. And this is why it encourages me so much. We are a church that all, we're just all about learning the word of God and listening to the word of God, but it doesn't stop there. We are a church that's passionate about living out the word of God. And that's been happening, and our church is just one that's growing in our love for one another, growing in our love for uh, others, and we want people to know the love of God through us. And today we're looking at examining the evidence. John's going to tell us in a simple way, you need to examine the evidence, what's coming into your life and what's going out of your life. With that said, would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's word. First John chapter 4 is where we are. And John writes this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard and what was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Heavenly Father, God, would you speak to us this morning in a clear and powerful way? God, we ask, we invite you to have your way in our lives today. So where there's changes that need to be made in our hearts, we ask that you would make those changes. Where there's priorities that are out of place, rearrange our lives. God, I humbly ask that you would speak through me in a powerful way today. Have your way in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anytime there's a new restaurant that opens up in the Central Valley that I'm interested in going to, or maybe it's a restaurant that I've never been to before, I want to examine the evidence. And I ask myself two questions. What am I hearing and what am I seeing? What, what am I hearing from my friends? What am I hearing from family members? What are people saying on Facebook? 
Is this a restaurant worth going to? Is it worth the wait? Is the food absolutely amazing? I'm asking that question, what am I hearing about this restaurant? But the second question I'm asking is, what am I seeing? Do do the portions look good? Do the pictures of the food look good? When people are coming out of the restaurant, uh, I'm looking at the ladies' faces and are they smiling? I'm looking for something else in the guys. For the guys, I'm looking at how they're dressed. Are they wearing pants that have an elastic waist? Let me get specific. Are they either wearing sweatpants or are these men wearing maternity pants, right? Is there a place where the stomach can just grow over the time that they eat? And I'm also, if I have time, I'm looking at the chef or I'm looking at the cook. Is he skinny? Because if he's skinny, he doesn't like his own food. But if he is huge... He can't get enough of his own food. So I'm asking myself the question, what am I hearing and what am I seeing? It's the same question that John is asking his readers to ask today. He says, as you examine the evidence of your life, what are you hearing and what are you seeing? What's allowed to flow into your life and what's flowing out of your life, and he's gonna break this down in a very simple yet profound way. As we look at examine the evidence, he says two things. Number one, in your notes, examine every idea in philosophy. Examine every idea in philosophy. In other words, John is saying don't believe everything that you hear. And that's the same for us today. Just because something is on the news, just because something is online, just because something is in social media, doesn't mean it's true. And I'm amazed at how many people will share something that they see on social media. They've never investigated it. They've never even read it. It's kind of like when it came out that Microsoft wanted to take over remote access of your computer so they could take care and eliminate any viruses. Two things. It wasn't Microsoft, and B, they weren't trying to eliminate any viruses, right? Not everything that we hear is true. And so what is John saying here? He's saying you need to test the spirits. In other words, you need to test these teachers because these false teachers and false prophets will share false ideas, false beliefs, false philosophies that ultimately flow from a worldly spirit, a wicked spirit, or a demonic spirit. So in a very simple, clear way, John is saying you need to examine every idea and philosophy that's out there. And the key to this is the Holy Spirit. John put it this way in 1 John 3, 24. He said, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. The Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. So we'll know when there's a deceitful scheme or a lie versus a truth. And so John's saying, don't believe everything that you hear. And there's lots of these false prophets that have gone out into the world. But Jesus was aware of this. And that's why Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, put it this way. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus is saying, watch out. They're out there. They look good on the outside, but inside they're evil. They're demonic. They're wicked. And so for us to be super practical, we can't listen to every seminary professor. We can't listen to every Christian teacher. We can't listen to everyone that calls themselves a pastor. Why? Because there are a lot of people that are preaching and teaching a different gospel. They may sound good. They may look good. They may be compassionate. They may be kind. They may be very sincere. But in the end, many of them are sincerely wrong because they've been deceived by a worldly or wicked spirit. Paul put it this way in 1 Timothy 4.1. He says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Paul's saying this this is happening. People are going to be deceived. And the reality is, is John's saying, put a filter on what comes into your life because we filter so much. I'm one of those guys that I do not like pulp in my orange juice. 
So what happens when I want a glass of orange juice? I buy the no pulp or I strain it. I use a strainer for my orange juice. Who else does not like pulp in their orange juice? Can you just raise your hand? Yeah, there's a lot of us. Now, anybody like pulp in their orange juice? Good, you like to chew it? That's weird. We will pray for you, all right? (laughs) I do not like to chew the beverages that I drink. But there's a filter that we put on so many things. We filter our computers so garbage doesn't come into our lives. We filter out our kids' friends so they're not caught up in hanging out with some wicked people. We put filters when we're looking for a car online. There's different filters according to size, shape, and color. We put filters on dating websites. What we're looking for in our potential spouse, that person that we're trying to date. Some of us have went on dates and we wish we had uh, more filters put on those dating websites, right? Um, My father-in-law, the first time I met Kelly's dad, went over to his house and he said, Jeremy, great to meet you. Do you mind if I ask you just a few questions? And I thought, no, not, not a big deal at all. And he was totally serious and the mood changed. He looked at me in the eyes and said, Jeremy, what qualifications do you have in your life that make you good enough to date my daughter? And I just sat back. I did not, not know what to say. He said, tell me about your education. What, what are you majoring in and what kind of grades are you getting? He said, Jeremy, are you, do you have a job? Is it a good job? Tell me a little bit about your work history. He said, Jeremy, have you been in other relationships before? I'm I'm, I'm nervous. Yes. He said, well, obviously none of those worked out. What makes you think this one will? (laughs) And I'm like shaking. He's grilling me. And then he looks at me with a serious face and smiles and says, I'm just messing with you, man. Glad to meet you. And I'm just like, seriously, right? You're going to need to wipe up the couch after I stand up. Um, (laughs) But he was just grilling me. He was in a, in a loving, funny way, uh, which was funny for him, not for me, just trying to filter out who his daughter was dating. And so John's saying that we need to filter what's coming into our lives. What authenticates them as being of God, these teachers, these prophets? How do we know whether they are speaking truth or speaking lies? And this isn't so that we can condemn a bunch of p- different people and be negative about a bunch of people. This is so we can approve the people that we listen to. Number one of two things that John says we need to do. Number one, they confess Jesus Christ. One of the qualifications for a godly teacher or prophet is that they unapologetically confess Jesus Christ. This means that Jesus is both Savior and Lord. This means that Jesus is God in the flesh. This means that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. He says in verse two, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Simple, easy, tangible way. It's it's teachers that submit their lives to Jesus Christ. How do we know if they're not of Jesus Christ and that they're liars? Verse three, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. The Antichrist, which is against Christ or in place of Christ. That's how you know somebody is a false teacher, a false prophet, that they've been deceived by an evil spirit, a wicked spirit, or a worldly spirit. He goes on in verse 4 and says, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John's saying that because God's inside you, you're going to experience victory. Because God's inside you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. John's saying that these Christians are not staying strong and not giving in to these false teachers and false prophets because they have superior intelligence. It's not because they've got this theological training. It's not because they've got clever arguments. It's not because they are aware of all these courts, these cults. It's because of the one who dwells inside of them. And so they affirm and they believe in Jesus Christ. But not only that, second of all in your notes, they affirm Scripture. Jesus in the Bible, to put it very simply. Verse 5, John says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. What do worldly teachers and worldly prophets say? Say stuff that the world wants to hear. They're anti-Christ, they're anti-Bible, they're anti-supernatural. If there's something that they can do or say or teach that will put Jesus in the scriptures in a negative way, that's what they do. Why? Because they're from the world. 
And then John says in verse 6, he says, we are from God. What does that mean? It means that John's one of the apostles. John's one of those 12 apostles selected by Jesus Christ that watched Jesus in his three years of ministry, watched Jesus die on the cross, saw the resurrected Jesus, was there for the ascension. He says, the difference between false teachers and us is that they're from the world and we are from God. We're speaking on behalf of God. That's why the New Testament so many of the letters and the books are from the apostles. Why? Because they were given the authority by God to teach us truth. And so John wants us to know that in a simple, clear way. What does that mean for us here at Shelter Cove? That means that everything that we do, every time we teach, it will always be funneled through the word of God and what Jesus says. We are unapologetically all about Jesus and the scriptures. That's the way it will always be. John's saying, filter everything that comes in. We need to examine every idea and philosophy. But he doesn't stop there. He's not saying you need to listen what comes in. He also says you need to pay attention and analyze and look and see what's coming out of your lives. And he says in point two, examine yourself. Examine yourself. In other words, what authenticates us as being of God? And John's going to break this down in six different ways, six different ways that we can tell that we are of God and that we've got love in our life. Number one is God's nature is love. God's nature is love. He puts it this way in verse seven and eight. It says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. The reality is, is if we're born of God, where well, we've surrendered our, Jesus, our life to Jesus Christ, we've been born again, the nature of God literally becomes a part of our lives and we can't help but loving people. Here's what it looks like in my own life. I will often joke around with my friends or staff and uh, I'll say the word somebody and I'm talking about somebody in specific, and everybody knows who it is. So if somebody just got a haircut, I'll say, somebody's got a haircut, and everybody looks at the person that got a haircut. Or if somebody got a new pair of shoes, I'll be like, somebody's wearing a nice pair of shoes, and everybody looks at the nice pair of shoes. And it's just a dumb thing that I do. Well, just this last week, uh, I was wearing my Dodger hat, and my son looks away, and he says, somebody's a Dodger fan, right? And he's speaking of me. I got done eating my dinner really fast, and he said, somebody was hungry, right? He's just starting to, to act like me and talk like me because he's my son. Poor kid, right? <laughs> Here's what John is saying, is that because you are a child of God, and God is love, you've got love inside you. You, you can't help but love people. The Spirit is going to love people through you in a supernatural way. Why? Because you've been born of God and you are a child of God. He also says if you have no love in your life, then you haven't been born of God because God's very nature is inside of us, which is love. This is a love that does something that shows interest or concern in another person simply because they're a person doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter if they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if they're black or white. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. It does not matter if they are a Democrat or a Republican. We love. Supernatural, unconditional, self-sacrificing. Why? Because this is the love that God has for us. And I love John, or 1 Corinthians 13, where it says that love is patient, that God is patient with every single one of us. And it doesn't matter where we are in life, even if you're in a season right now and you're embracing a life where you're like, I don't love God, God still loves you. Why? Because he is love. And he's anxiously awaiting for you to love him in return. But God's nature is love. Second of all, we receive God's love in the form of Jesus. In your notes, we receive God's love in the form of Jesus. God's love is a gift. The gift is Jesus. God took the initiative with us, and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins in our place that we would have life 
with God, but, but God took the initiative. It's what separates Christianity from every other religion. Every other religion is based upon what you do, how you live, based upon your works. No, Christianity is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took the initiative. When I was in college and had been through a season where I hadn't been dating a lot and just really just trying to just develop my own walk with, with Christ, the college pastor came up to me and said, hey, you know, you need to go and talk to some of these gals. And there's a lot of great godly Christian gals. And so I went out and was hanging in the back room with just a buddy, just talking and laughing. And we went out and started talking, talking and mingling with some gals. And there was this gal named Kelly Robinson there. She's now my wife of over 17 years, which is awesome. She hasn't killed me yet, which is great. Uh, she was there eating just chips and guacamole and all that kind of stuff and started talking to her. And uh, we had some of the same uh, classes. They were huge classes at Sac State. We didn't even realize that. And so started talking, same major. And I could have done the whole, hey, it'd be great to connect and study together, right? But I just said, hey, I'd love to just hang out with you and get to know you. I took the initiative. Took the initiative because she looked good, she smelled good, and she just was good, right? That's, that's just what I was thinking in my life. God's taken the initiative with every single one of us through Jesus. And it's not because we look good. It's not because we sound good. It's not because we are good or because we, we just, whatever, fill in the blank good. It's because he is good. That's why God sent Jesus, because he is good. He took the initiative. And this is what John says in verse 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is a public declaration from God that says, I love you and I'm gonna send Jesus to prove it to do what you can't do yourself. And he uses this word propitiation, which means that God satisfied his own wrath upon Jesus Christ. He didn't compromise his holiness. He didn't compromise his judgment that Jesus was this perfect sacrifice in the eyes of God. And so Jesus sent his son as the propitiation for our sins. Thirdly, in your notes, we live out God's nature by loving others. That's what John wants us to know. We live out God's nature by loving others. Now, how does an invisible God communicate his love? Yes, we've got the word of God. And yes, the most powerful way that he communicates his love is through his son, Jesus. Well, Jesus came and he lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He went to the cross for us, he conquered the grave, conquered sin, conquered death, and now he's ascended, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So how does God demonstrate and communicate his love now to people? He does it through us. He does it through believers, where we literally, because God dwells inside us, his love literally flows through our lives got a 13-year-old son at home. His name is Jacob. Many of you know Jake or heard of Jake. He is just a, a treasure in my life. He has a chromosome disorder. Uh, he has special needs that are very severe, severe, so he doesn't walk. He doesn't talk. He doesn't eat through his mouth. And I have the privilege just daily of helping feed Jake, uh, change Jake, um, bathe Jake, um, dress Jake. And my, my prayer is is that Jake would experience the love of God through me. He's never he gonna hear about the love of God, but he can experience the love of God through his dad. And I was thinking about that this last week, and I thought, you know what? As cool as that is, and the joy that I get from that, and all that God has taught me through loving Jake, it's really easy to love him. You know why? Not once in his life has he ever talked back to me. Not once has he argued with me. And so as I was looking at this, and we live out God's nature by loving others, it's like, yes, God, I've got the privilege to love my son, but that's easy. I want to love people that argue with me. I want to love people that get frustrated with me, that hate me, that fill in the blank. I want to love with this supernatural love 
that only comes from God because that's what John's all about. In verse 7, verse 11, verse 12, he says, love one another. In other words, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to love each other, but it doesn't stop there. We have to love everyone. Now, I'm not saying approve of what everybody does, but we demonstrate the love of God to every person that God puts in our life, including the people that are not like us. So let me just lovingly challenge you for a moment. Who in your life are you actively loving that is not like you. Let me, let, me, let me clarify that a little bit. Who in your life are you loving that does not look like you? That does not believe like you? That does not vote like you? Or that does not have the same sexual orientation as you? Because that's how we show and demonstrate the love of God. It's a supernatural love. Who in your life are you loving that is only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit? Rick Warren, a famous pastor in Southern California, put it this way. He said, God teaches us to love by putting some unlovely people around us. You know what they're called? They're called family, right? It takes no character to love people who are lovely and loving to you. Wow, how profound is that? We're so quick to love people that love us and that are easy to love, but we live out God's nature by loving others. Fourthly, in our notes, love is evidence of the Holy Spirit and fellowship with God. Love is evidence of the Holy Spirit and fellowship with God. And I've had some conversations with some of the people at Shelter Cove, again, recently, that are loving people that are difficult to love. And I'm like, how are you doing this? And they're like, it's not me. It's only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit. These people that have hurt them in the past, abused them in the past, rejected them in the past, have been just jerks to them in the past, and they're still trying to model and communicate and demonstrate the love of Jesus. It is only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so John wants us to know that we've got the Holy Spirit. He wants us to know that we've got fellowship with God. In fact, several times in this letter, John says, you know, by this we know. He wants to be confident of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the fellowship that we have with God. And he puts it this way, starting in verse 13. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and believe in the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And I love this, this assurance that John wants us to have. And he talks about believing in the Son of God and confessing the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, that, that Jesus is the only one that can save us. In other words, that Jesus is literally God in the flesh, that Jesus is both our Savior and our Lord. When we confess that, when we live that out, we know that we've got the Holy Spirit inside us and we are walking what the Bible says is in koinonia in the Greek. It's this fellowship with God. And where does that start? It starts with us surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. Once we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we, we eventually we get baptized. Why? Because baptism always follows belief. And that's, that's a marker for so many people's lives where they stand up in front of the church and they're unashamed of Jesus Christ because there's no such thing as a secret agent Christian. But it's this evidence of the Holy Spirit and fellowship with God. Some translations put it this way. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God lives in him. Instead of that word abide, it says lives. In other words, God's living inside us and we're literally living inside God and there's this oneness and there's this fellowship, what makes it possible for God to love people through us that the world would call unlovable. But it's possible because of the fellowship we have with God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Fifthly, in your notes, love gives us confidence about our eternity about our eternity. Verse 17, by this, love is perfected with us 
so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because he is, so also are we in this world. How is our love perfected? Well, he just told us because God is dwelling in us and we're dwelling in God. But how can it be that we have no fear on the day of judgment when we stand before God because we have embraced, we have received his son, Jesus Christ, who has dealt with all of our sin, past, present, and future, and has given us a promise, a hope, a confidence to be with God in heaven forever because of Jesus Christ. He doesn't stop there. John shares this verse that is shared a lot of times at weddings. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. In other words, fear and love are are incompatible. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. There was a young bride that was super nervous about her wedding. And she struggled with being nervous and fear and anxiety. And she, she, this was her like life verse. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And so she was thinking, you know what? Um, for my wedding cake, I want this verse inscribed on my cake. And she got on the phone and she called the catering company. And it was months before the wedding. And she ordered the cake and she told them the verse, First uh, John Uh, chapter 4, 18, and the the wedding was approaching. It was about a week out, and they called her back, and they said, are you sure this is the verse that you want on your cake? And she said, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm positive. They said, are you sure? She said, yes, this is like my life verse. I think it's gonna speak to me that day and a lot of other people, and they said, okay. So it was the day of the wedding, and she went over, and she was checking everything out, and the ceremony had already started and happened, and it was reception time, and she went to her cake, and she, she read the verse, but it wasn't, 1 John 4, 18, it was John 4, 18. And this is what it said. It said, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. We need to make sure we get our verses right, don't we? Perfect love casts out all, all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Some of you are just getting that right now. We're going to let you catch up. How does it cast out all fear? It casts out all fear of the past. Why? Because we know we've been forgiven. It casts out all fear of the present. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is inside me, living through me. God always wants what's best for me. How does it cast all fear out of the immediate future? Well, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Then how does it cast out all fear of our eternal future? Because Jesus has promised an eternal dwelling place for us. And where there's Jesus, there is the presence of joy. Here's what I want you to write down. Fear breeds insecurity. Love breeds security. Say that one more time. Fear breeds insecurity. Love breeds security. So so moms and dads, if we want our kids and our children to grow up being very secure, we don't want to have an atmosphere of fear. We want to have an atmosphere of love. They need to know two things without a shadow of a doubt that you love them. You love them not because they get good grades. You love them not because they're doing well in athletics. You love them not because they've got a lot of friends or they're popular. You love them because they are your child, period. But the second thing that will allow there to be great stability in your home is that they do not question the love that you have for your spouse. That despite what happens, despite the times where mom and dad may get frustrated at each other, they may raise their voices at each other, they may at times argue with each other. Let's be real. They may at times fight with each other. They always love each other And mom and dad will always stay married. You want to create stability in your home and security. Communicate the love that you have for your kids and the love that you have for your spouse. Why was John so secure? He knew he was loved by Jesus. In his gospel, who did he refer to himself as? The one whom Jesus loved. He was secure in the love that Jesus had for him. He goes on in verse 19 in our passage, we love because he first loved us. God is the initiator. We are the responder. 
So much of what the entire New Testament is all about is about God sending Jesus because God loves us and he cares about us and he wants to not only rescue us, he wants to give us life because without Jesus Christ, we are spiritually dead. We love because he first loved us. God gives us confidence about our eternity. And then lastly, in our notes, loving others is essential to loving God. John says in verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. John just says it the way it is. For he who does not love his brother, whom he can, who has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. John's saying, if you, you, you can't love your brother, who you do see, you can't love God, who you don't see. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you don't love your brother, John says very simply and plainly, you're a liar. And then in verse 21, he says, And this commandment we have had from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And I often think about at times I, just how difficult it is at times to love. And my, my focus uh, sadly enough, and this is just the flesh that comes out, is I focus on how difficult people are to love at times. I focus on how people have treated me. I focus on how challenging it can be, how, how sacrificial, maybe how tired I get. John doesn't bring up any of that. John just says, God is love. God's inside of you. Love one another. And as I've been thinking this through and, and praying about it and realizing that there is one great obstacle in my life that keeps God's love from th flowing through me. It keeps me from bl loving others. Bless you. Twice. Um, there's something inside me that just, just hinders God's ability to, to, to love me. Uh, and it's me. It's my pride. It's my selfishness. It's my justification. It's my flesh. So one of the things I, I've just been doing recently is I'm just praying, God, get me out of the way. Get my desires out of the way. Get my selfishness out of the way. And God, would you just love anybody and everybody that you put in front of me? Because I want people to experience the love of God through Jeremy. And so he said, we have to examine the evidence. Examine what comes into your life and what flows out of your life. You have to examine every idea and philosophy. But not only that, John's saying, you have to examine yourself. You have to examine your own heart. And so two questions um, at the end of your notes. The first one is a, a simple one. It's one of the most powerful questions we could ever ask in this life is, do you love Jesus? Because there's no question about God's love for you through Jesus. There's no question about Jesus' love for you. He died for you. He suffered for you. Died in our place. He died for our sins. It's never to be questioned because he proved it. But maybe the greatest question we have to ask ourselves is, do you love Jesus? Why? Because everything in life depends on how we answer this question. And it's not a kind of, sort of, maybe, somewhat. It's either a yes or it's either a no. And if you've got the love of God and the love of Jesus inside you, it will be reflected in the way that you love others. And then second of all, what neighbor will you show love to this week? What neighbor do you not know well? What neighbor, maybe has there been issues with you in the past? Maybe who, whatever it is. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. It's two words. Just do something. Maybe you mow their yard. Maybe you take them a pumpkin pie, fruit cake, depending on what kind of fruit cake it is, right? They may be a really mean thing to do. Uh, but do something that would demonstrate the love of God to your neighbor this week. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thanks for loving us. God, thank you for, for John 
and his willingness to write what we all need to hear. And God, it's simply that you love us and you expect us to love others. God, I'm sorry for the times in my own life where I've made it more complicated. God, I pray that you would help me to get out of the way of you. I want you to love people deeply through me. For my brothers and sisters in this room, God, we want you to love people deeply through us. And so, God, would you, would you help us do that? With all heads bowed, nobody looking around, maybe you're here today, and if you were to die, you don't know if you would spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, that we can have confidence before God solely because we have Jesus Christ in our lives. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you can do that right now. It could be done through a prayer that goes something like this. It's not the words of the prayer, it's the attitude of the heart. Dear Jesus, come into my life and make me new. Forgive me of my sin and change me from the inside out. I want the rest of my life to be the best of my life. From this day forward, I give you total control of my life. With all heads bowed, nobody looking around, but if this is the first time you want to invite Jesus Christ into your life and that was the attitude of your heart, I want to just pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but would you just raise your hand and look at me wherever you are. You say, that's me today. I want Jesus Christ in my life. Just raise your hand wherever you are and look at me. Good, I see that hand. Is there someone else? It's the greatest decision we could ever make. Good, I see those hands over there. Is there anyone else? Say, I want Jesus. I want to know that I'm saved. I want to experience God's love in a personal, powerful way. Is there anyone else today? Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the hands that were raised. Hearts that have responded to you. How we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.